Welcome to the Republican Professor. Today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation. Thanks for being here, Alan. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited to uh, talk to you because I'm a life member of the Second Amendment Foundation. My family, some members of my family are as well. And um, so I've been following the work of the Second Amendment Foundation um, and appreciate all that you do. Well, thank you very much for your, your support of you and your family. We much appreciate it. Yeah. And you're located in Washington. Is that right? Well, our national office is in Bellevue, Washington, but we have uh, employees all across the country in, in various locations. Cool. Wow. Um, I had originally reached out because in the newsletter I get the uh, the death of the state senator Sam Sloan was mentioned, and he was a Republican state senator in Hawaii for 20 years from 1996 to 2016. And he was elected when I was living in Hawaii. I was uh, I lived there for four years. I went to college there. I was stationed there in the military. And I remember seeing his office. I think it was in Kahala Mall, I believe it was, uh, which would be his district, um, East Honolulu, I believe it was. I'm pretty sure that's a real memory that I have. It is. And, <laughs> and I, I thought, man, I didn't know he was a solid gun guy. And it, you know, because Republicans, you don't know. It's, you, there's the there's the solid Republicans. And then there's the wishy-washy ones that don't seem to have any common sense. And I I was excited to see that he was one of the good ones. <laughs> so and he was the only one in the state Senate. For, for a long time, the Republican in the state Senate in Hawaii. So I know that Hawaii is filled with crazy people uh, in the legislature. So um, how well did you know Sam Sloan? I knew Sam Sloan very, very well back from college days when we were both on the board of directors of Young Americans for Freedom, oh, National cool. Conservative Political Youth Group. <laughs> and I think I first met Sam when he was in Pennsylvania prior to him ever going to Hawaii. Wow. So what college was this? Well, I went to the University of Tennessee, and Sam, of course, went, I think, believe it was the University of Pennsylvania is where Sam graduated from. Oh, okay. So even though he was in Hawaii, you guys stepped, kept in contact and were, this is before Zoom, so. Yeah, when he got his degree from the University of Pennsylvania, he went to work for the Bank of Hawaii uh, doing analysis for them for, on uh, economic stuff. And uh, so we stayed in touch. Yeah. And then uh, in Hawaii, we, 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 I, I go there, he had me come over to speak to some of his groups he worked with many times. So we, we knew each other very well. Awesome. Now, was this one of your first conversations was the gun issue, guns, firearms? Uh, well, I guess the best <laughs> way to say this is when I was in college, I was majoring in nuclear engineering and to get away from oh. the textbook, so to speak. Uh, I got involved in politics a bit and got involved with Young Americans for Freedom, which is where I met Sam. And the Young Americans for Freedom had a, a regional office in Seattle uh, that I ended up going to work at to solve some of the problems they were having in, in, in growth there. And there was an ad hoc committee for the students committee for the right to keep their arms based out of that office that was national in scope. And so that's how I started getting into the gun issue. Aside from the fact when I was in college, I worked for Congressman John Duncan, and I got to answer all the mail from constituents on the gun rights issues. Oh, that's cool. Now, what got you, what, well, do you happen to know what got Sam, just for posterity's sake, do you happen to know what got Sam Sloan into firearms in the first place? Did he grow up in a gun family or... I don't know if he grew up in a gun family or not, but, you know, Sam was very libertarian and cared about individual rights and the Bill of Rights, Second Amendment issues. Uh, and then I know he got very involved with the Hawaii Rifle and Pistol Association, you know, in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, he, I think he was on their board for a while as well. Okay. Gotcha. That's cool. Did you guys ever go shooting together? <laughs> we may have gone shooting one time from memory in Hawaii, uh, at a gun club there, but I'm not hundred percent positive. We just visited the gun club, but we actually shot. It was a number of years ago. 
one of the ways I got my wife to marry me was that I lived in Hawaii and she, that was a, that was pretty convincing for her to come out. And the, one of the first things we did was we went to Cocoa Head Range uh, down there in Honolulu and uh, by Diamond Head. And there's an outdoor range there. Yes. And I think it used to be there. You have? Okay. It used to be free. I'm hoping it's still free. I think we just walked up and started shooting. Um, (laughs) It wasn't very crowded. Uh, that's kind of cool. That was, that was in the nineties, um, 97. Now he was elected 1996. Did he ever share with you any of the stories about gun legislation battles that took place in Hawaii? Oh yeah. We, we talked about it a lot. I testified before the Hawaii legislature, thanks to Sam. Uh, um, and so, cool. yeah, we, we, yeah, we were engaged in, in Hawaii as well as nationally. Sam, of course, you know, was on the Second Amendment Foundation, was one of our initial first uh, directors on our board when we formed. And until his death, he served on the board, one of the longest serving directors we had. So it was over 48 years that Sam was on the Second Amendment, Second Amendment Foundation's board of directors. Wow. So the work of second amendment foundation, it was originally YAF that brought you together. Then how did that turn into SAF connection? How did, how did that all come about? Well, when I, when I founded the second amendment foundation, I was looking for good people to be on the board. And uh, Sam was, you know, very engaged in in politics in Hawaii, defending gun rights. And, uh, you know, and obviously then ended up in in the state Senate uh, and was a good person to have on our board. Yeah, big time. Uh, what did Sam major in at the University of Hawaii, or sorry, Pennsylvania? Was it finance? Yeah, fi- finance, business. Uh, I, I believe he got a graduate degree there, if I'm not mistaken. And fun question. Do you happen to know if he was a Glock guy or a 1911 guy or a revolver guy, or was he all of the above? I think that probably all of the above would, would be the best answer. I'm kind of an all of the above person too. That's why I put that in there. Um, so this is this. I, I was so excited to see that there was a, a real champion for the Second Amendment in this Hawaii legislature. There, um, it's so discouraging to see the direction of Hawaii since then. I know that it's been spotty too. I know that the first. U.S. Senator of Hawaii was a Republican named Hiram Fong, Fong, one of the uh, senators. He he was sketchy on Second Amendment stuff, as uh, Steve Hallbrook points out in his America's Rifle. I was I was really sad to see that. But um, do you do you have hope for places like Washington? I mean, the same thing's happening in Washington. Uh, we've, of course, experienced it in California for a long time. Um do you have any hope about the direction of some of these rough states? Well, let me say yes, but not legislatively. Uh, it's the court system, and that's where we've been very engaged and very effective. In fact, last week we just won a, a, a case knocking out the, the man on, ban on magazine capacity in the state of California in, in federal court. Uh, and we've been very successful in courts in California, but I think right now we have 18 lawsuits going on at one time against the state of California or various political subdivisions. So we have 54 nationally all over the country, but 18 of them are in California alone. And we've been very successful in federal court in Hawaii as well. So, uh, and Guam for that matter too. Uh, So we're pretty heavily engaged, but it's the court system that's helping us out right now. Uh, The Bruin decision uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, about 16 months ago or so has really changed the playing field a lot and put the burden more on the government rather than on individual citizens when we go to court and change how gun laws are looked at or have to be looked at at by the lower courts. So now it really it's all about the actual text of the Second Amendment Foundation and the uh, history and tradition uh, of gun laws at the time in 1791 when the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment was adopted. I'm really impressed with, uh, Alan, I'm really impressed that you have the nuclear engineering background and you sound like a lawyer. So do, do you have a legal background? 
I don't really have a formal legal background, but I've been an expert witness in, in courts uh, on, on gun rights cases. And of course, I deal, we we're currently dealing with a little over 30 uh, attorneys around the country following the various lawsuits that we have. And we have filed over 250 lawsuits uh, wow. you know, since our inception. And so I'm, I'm, when it comes to gun rights, Second Amendment issues, uh, I'm sort of like a, an, a, an attorney's resource. Yeah. Well, all this dealing with attorneys, it's it's inter- and it's an interesting story of how maybe if you want to talk about how the Second Amendment was found, Second Amendment Foundation was founded. When was it founded? We were founded in 1974 as an education legal defense fund, uh, as a nonprofit 501c3 RS designated organization. Donations are tax deductible. Mm-hmm. We're also ta- obviously tax exempt. Yeah, uh, and we were founded because back back in 1974 there was no type foundation like that supporting Second Amendment rights, uh, and we thought it was really important. And one of our early goals was to be able to get a case to the United States Supreme Court. And we looked wow. at the playing field in 1974. It was rather bleak for us because, quite honestly, there's only one case that really talked about the individual right to keep their arms, and it yeah. wasn't a federal case. It was a state case in the state of Oregon. And hmm. guess what? It didn't even deal, deal with a gun. It dealt with a knife. Oh, uh, the really? I was arrested for using a knife in self-defense. Uh, and the court ruled really had a, under the state constitution, had a, a right to keep their arms and a knife counted. Uh, and and that was the, the only case law we really had. And it, what hmm. was interesting, there was no real law review articles talking about the individual right to keep their arms. There was no uh, historical journals that had any articles. There was no popular culture magazines that talked about the issue. So we convened uh, very early in the 1970s, a legal scholars conference at Boston University. And we had about 25, 30 uh, scholars and attorneys that attended it. And we, and we laid out all the kinds of things we needed to do, get published, to build a foundation. So if somebody ever went to court to, to follow a Second Amendment case, they'd have things that they'd be able to cite in their briefs There was because we really had nothing. Yeah. And we accomplished a lot over a few years uh, we basically uh, upended the, you know, uh, hi- historical and legal journals with becoming individual right oriented so that there was all this stuff we could do. And then in, a, a number of years after that, uh, we had another legal scholars conference, at the University of Arizona's Law School in Tucson, uh, where we brought in about 60 key legal scholars and attorneys some of which were not pro gun rights at that point because we wanted to bring in and have them critique our work so we know where our weaknesses might be. Uh, and what came out of that conference was a very important thing. And that was we had the dean of the University of Florida Law School, who oh, wow. I can't That's say cool. was a Second Amendment person, but he was an expert on 14th Amendment Corporation, oh. who went through the fact that we were not going to be able to sue all these state laws we wanted to sue because the four- Second Amendment was never incorporated through the 14th Amendment right. and, made, and made applicable to the states. Yeah. And so we had to sue the federal government. And at the time, you know, uh, right. the federal government didn't exactly have a whole lot of a- anti-gun laws that were challengeable, so to speak. And that focused everybody on Washington, D.C., which is not a state, it's a federal enclave. And they had a ban on the possession of a handgun in your own home. Plus, you couldn't have a functional rifle or a shotgun. It had to be broken down. So for self-defense, you had nothing to defend yourself with. That's horrible. That is insane. I mean, when you when you back up and say all that we there has been tremendous progress wouldn't you yes. say from that i think there's been tremendous progress from that and of course you know the washington dc case was the first one to go to the supreme court known as heller right uh, were you was, involved with that case our attorney alan gura argued it uh we filed oh. a very important amicus brief in it uh-huh. uh and uh oh i didn't know alan gura was part of the uh, saf I, I yeah, he's he, he's now no longer doing gun litigation, but for a number of years he w- was involved with us. And in fact, the day we won the McDonald case, where the Supreme Court said the Second Amendment was an individual right and knocked out the, the D.C. gun ban, because we were pretty sure we we're going to win. That same day, we filed McDonald versus Chicago to incorporate the Second Amendment through the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, making it applicable to states. Uh, knocked out Chicago's handgun ban and also the incorporation of it you know, through the 14th Amendment now opened up the floodgates so we could file all these suits we currently have going on today and allowed all these other gun groups to file suits as well. Because prior to that, we did, couldn't file a federal court against these state and local laws. Yeah. So you filed the same day in, in Chicago 
that's that's like you guys are not wasting any time. Holy cow! No, but you're talking about it gets fun because we of course we won the Chicago suit, but the same yeah. day we won the Chicago suit, we filed another suit that same day known as Baton versus Purdue in North Carolina against the Emergency Powers Act, which in case of snowstorms, oh. hurricanes, allowed them to suspend Second Amendment rights. So you couldn't open, you couldn't go buy a gun, you couldn't buy ammunition, you couldn't leave your house with your firearm. Uh, you know, and you can go out of your porch to protect your property. We oh. won that one, but of course, North Carolina, not being a very anti-gun state, chose not to appeal it. So it didn't really go up the system and, and make a whole lot of precedent, but it did scare another other states that had uh, emergency powers laws like that to start to repeal theirs. So we won a pretty big victory with that case. Did you, you want it in state court or federal court? Fe- federal court, in fe- oh, federal okay. trial court. Okay, I see. Wow, that's... Yeah, I've heard stories of Katrina where you've heard the stories, right? Where they the well, mayor yeah, was taking like, guns or something. What the heck is going yeah, on? Yeah, in Katrina, they confiscated guns, and the Second Man Foundation went to court on that and got a court order, uh, uh, an injunction stopping them from doing that. That's another one of our court victories we had was the Katrina, you know, stuff where they're going home to house to house, confiscating firearms during the during the hurricane. Uh, and we won that one as well. It's about eighty percent of the case law that's been won in support of Second Amendment rights in the courts have been won by the Second Amendment Foundation and or our attorneys. Wow. I'm now I feel like I'm uh starstruck right here because I feel like I just found out you're an actor in one of the favorite films or something. Cause I, I'm teach I t- last year, for example, I, I've taught the Second Amendment in college here in California. And um one of the interesting experiences I've had was at California State University. I was somehow they taught they hired me to teach the civil liberties. I don't know what they were thinking, but <clears throat> but um that was in 2018 and uh, the spring and we just finished the first amendment and uh you know I'm just going through, you know, and we're on the second amendment at this time and um and right then was when the Florida thing happened, remember with the Parkland and yes. uh, all those kids uh got on Twitter and and tried to generate some kind of uh youth movement about this and um so that that was happening right as we got to the second amendment in my class and i just was thinking oh my gosh I, I i'm so glad i'm teaching this class because one of the things i had my very diverse student group read was just the case law like oh you know otis mcdonald i said look up otis McDonald. look at what he looks like Google image him. He's black. He's got dark skin. And the city of Chicago is spending, how much do you think they're spending? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to keep him disarmed in an emergency when the police are not there. And oh, this is a great story. It probably cost the city of Chicago a million dollars for that case alone. And then, of course, we sued Chicago afterwards when they changed the law. We still had a suit for the new laws they passed, which still weren't constitutional and didn't pass muster. But Otis's story is a great story. His mother, when he was a a teenager, you know, basically uh, put him on a train from Mississippi uh, to Chicago with a few dollars she had left to give him and said, go make, you know, go to Chicago. Uh, get out of here. There's no future for you here and make your mama proud. I knew that story. But when we won the case, McDowell versus Chicago, I'm walking down the Supreme Court steps with Otis and he stops me midway down the steps and says, Alan, I just want you to know that if it weren't for you and the Second Amendment Foundation, I wouldn't have been able to make my mama proud. And I didn't have a dry eye. I mean, I, and then I realized wow. you know, this isn't about a piece of paper that has written on a Bill of Rights or Second Amendment. This is really about human rights and real people. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it, you know, and, and that's when I, I realized the work we've been doing is really, really important. Absolutely. And going back further to to Heller, um, I'll share another brief anecdote that was related to Hawaii. Um, I was in undergraduate in Hawaii in the 90s when Sam Sloan was a state senator and I had a federal and state government course that I was required to take. And uh, it was at Kaneohe Marine Corps Station. And uh, the textbook, I still have the textbook. Um, I bring it into my classes now to show 
the difference between the te- how the text it was i think two paragraphs on the second amendment and it was one of the paragraph i mean they were technically correct it with some of the language they were used they you know it wasn't the best language to to characterize miller the miller decision for example in during uh what, what was that the new deal um which is the only federal case at that time uh, that went to the Supreme Court. Well, actually, say. Miller yeah. was in 1937. Okay, so, so I, during... I can't the... remember if that was the New Deal or not. Yeah, yeah, during and, Great Depression. But, but what you raised, I just want to make a comment about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you continue. Sure. Miller was parading with a sawed-off shotgun. Also, I think it was in Chicago. And uh, what, what happened was they arrested him and said that you know, he had a gun, illegal gun, and the courts basically ruled that, you know, the gun had to really resemble a militia type firearm and a sawed off shotgun didn't. Well, what's interesting is Miller argued, defended himself pro se, he didn't have an attorney. When the Supreme yeah. Court took that case, he was in prison. And so there's only one side that argued before the Supreme Court. And I don't know of another case where yeah. only one side got to argue before the Supreme Court. Yeah. But if there was two sides arguing, somebody could have pointed out that in fact, sawed off shotguns maybe do resemble a militia firearm. They were called trench guns in World War I. But of course, none of that got raised. And in that case, they never ruled directly on the individual right to keep their arms. That's right. They, they just ruled on what type of gun it might cover and yeah. argued that the sort of shotgun didn't really resemble a t- militia type firearm. So hence he was guilty. Right. And none of that information was in my textbook about, I learned that when I was in graduate school. Like I, I, you know, it was on my own reading too. It was never part of a course uh, where that that's a huge deal. I don't know if any major, like you said, my, my PhD is in public law and, and American politics. And I, I don't know if any major case that is celebrated and, I, and maybe even any major case, there might be one, but where only one side was argued. I mean, it's an adversarial posi- uh, uh, situation. It's an adversarial system. And the the judges just go by what's presented. And if one side is not even there, <laughs> how can you brag about that case? Especially if the guy was in prison and he didn't have a chance to, to you know. Anyway, uh, I just, I, I agree. I'm thankful that you pointed that out. <laughs> one side. Can you believe that? Uh, so... Yeah, so I'm in this state and federal government course at there at McConaughey Marine Corps Station, and uh, now my my professor wasn't he he didn't have an axe to grind or anything like that. I don't know what he his personal feelings were about this, but the the Second Amendment got such short attention, and I I cannot believe it, with as important as firearms are to the history of the United States and and everything from the revolution, the colonial period and the revolution to the settling of the West to training uh, for, for war and raising young men uh, that, that, that stuff would not be mentioned at all in the textbook. So anyway, so I'm teaching this course at Cal state Fullerton and I point this all out and then I show them Heller versus DC Right. Or was it D.C. versus Heller? I forget. Was it D.C. versus well, Heller at the C- yeah. Supreme Court? It, initially, uh, it turned out to be D.C. versus Heller. It was Heller versus D.C., but then at the appeals court level, when Heller won and D.C. had to appeal it, it then became D.C. versus Heller. OK, so Heller won at the three judge panel. Yes, he did. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, he did. And I'll just tell you an inside baseball story. The day that decision came out. I was in Nuremberg, Germany at World Forum for Future Sports Shooting, uh, you know, annual meeting where we served on their executive committee. And our keynote speaker was Anthony Scalia, Justice Scalia. And cool. uh, I, I spent time with him that day and we didn't talk directly about the case because we didn't want him to be disqualified from, we knew at that point, he was probably going to appeal it. We but, all thank you for that decision right now. <laughs> Yeah, but just it was five to four. Yeah, Judge Scalia said to me, you know, Alan, you know, it only takes four votes to hear a case in the Supreme Court, but it takes five to win it. You know, if we don't have five to win it, there aren't going to be four to hear it. So when the Supreme Court took that case, I felt pretty confident. Hmm. That's awesome. 
Uh, yeah, so I I laid out the facts of this, right? Dick Heller was a, I think he was a law enforcement guy, right? He had some kind of official capacity where he had to use a gun for his job. He was trained. And then he goes home and he can't have it. And he can't register it. And then you're supposed to register it. And you can't have a long gun put together either in D.C. And this is all done for the reason of public safety and to make everybody safe. Um, but that was the situation is you're a criminal if you are ready to defend yourself. Just being ready. You're not even doing it. Just being ready to defend yourself. Being able to. So that my students look at me and they're like, this is, this doesn't sound right. This sounds like innocent conduct that is now criminal because being ready to defend yourself is, and, and first of all, the self-defense is not criminal. That's, that's innocent. And being ready to defend yourself is certainly definitely not criminal conduct. It shouldn't be criminalized. So my students in, in California, this is what gives me hope, Alan, is they got it. And even though Parkland was going on, I, I took a poll and I said at the beginning, before we covered the cases, I, I said, how many of you guys think that the answer, the answer, because somebody asked, what's the answer? How do we stop these gun violence or whatever? The way they put it, I always rephrase and I say, I think you mean, how do we stop murder? That the murder is the issue, right? Assault, violent crime. And self-defense has always been one of the ways you you respond to that that's historically been the case 80 percent were for gun con more gun control at that time after we covered these cases you're talking about that you your group one um it was flipped uh 80 percent now thought were for the individual right to keep and bear arms so Bravo to you for all of the work that you're going into that. Well, thank now, you for your kind words. You know, it really depends on these on polls that you see out there. That it's how, that's how the questions are worded. Uh, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, nobody's for gun violence, so to speak, even though I never knew a gun pick itself up, you know, and shoot somebody. I, <laughs> I, I never knew a gun that had a brain to hate with and a finger to pull its own trigger. Uh, but when you actually frame these questions, you know, uh, for the right of self-defense and the means they have for self-defense, uh, things change a whole lot in that polling data. Yeah, I've noticed that John Lott is really good. He's all over the wording on, on these things. I follow him, and we've had him as a guest on here. So, uh, Alan, you have this nuclear engineering background. How did you get into firearms personally? Did you grow up in a gun family? That's a very good question. I grew up in New York City, and of course, oh. of course, in New York, you know, nobody has a gun to defend themselves for all practical purposes. Yeah. So the answer was no. The first time I actually got to fire a firearm was when I was in the army, and so uh, that was my experience with firearms. But I came to it more not from the, the gun itself, but from the freedom aspect. I mean, the, the right to determine your own future, the right to have the means to defend yourself, your family, your loved ones, uh, and the fact that, you know, the government shouldn't have, have a monopoly on firepower, so to speak. Uh, that, that's not what the founding fathers intended or wanted, and that's that's why the you know, Bill of Rights includes the Second Amendment. And so I came to it from, that, from the freedom aspect of it. It's not the government's job to tell me what I can and cannot have to defend myself with. Wow. So it was... Yeah, it's not, it's not like you were, you know, driving around your pickup truck with your chew and your shotgun back there blowing away, uh, you know, the signs on the side of the road. You had this very intellectual draw to this, uh, the ideas of the Second Amendment. And now that this is what you do, right? You're, are you still yeah. doing this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, it's real more of the ideas are our founding fathers. Uh, right. You know, okay. The philosophies that they had, wanting to keep government limited in scope and, and giving rights and freedoms and protecting those to the American people. I mean, they really, the founding fathers didn't really give us the right to keep our arms. The Second Amendment doesn't give you the right to keep our arms. It just it puts in code that the government can't take it away from you. It's basically a God given right, was always considered to be one. Yeah, right. And I noticed that 
there was this butterfly case. Are you involved with that butterfly knife case in Hawaii? I think it was. Do you, are you familiar with this? Yeah, I'm fully familiar with it. We were not involved in it. Uh, I, I believe an organization called KnifeRights.org was it was really involved in it. But yeah, it was obviously that was that was a very good case to bring. Now, is it your position that knives are included in the Second Amendment? Yeah, uh, the second one says, it doesn't say the right right to bear guns. It says the right to bear arms, and a knife is right. an arm. So there's no doubt. And again, I go back to that very first case that was around when we were first founded in 1974 in Oregon, yeah. where right. the Oregon, you know, state supreme court you know, ruled that a knife is an arm and protected by the state protection for the right to keep your arms in Oregon, and that's where that sort of comes from. So I was really glad to see that case in Hawaii. We supported it. That. The the issue of knives, I'm not as familiar with, but I just happened to know based on, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. I was in Walmart in California looking at the knives. This is back when they, well, I think they still sell knives, actually. This is back when they sold ammo. You could easily just get ammo. You know, uh, I used to pick up a box every time I was there. And there, there happened to be a, a LA County Sheriff deputy standing next to me uh, looking at the knives. And so we had a conversation about this and I, I said, Hey, let me ask you, uh, what's the legality of all these things? I don't know anything about knife laws. And he, uh, he took a big sigh, a big deep breath. <laughs> and he said, well, um, yeah, it's, it's very complicated and probably the average person has no idea how much knives are regulated from county to county, let alone at the state level. And it changes based on whether you're in an incorporated area or not an incorporated area. And, it, and he was, I, my eyes started to gla glaze over. So I said, Hey, so this six inch hunting knife right here, if I were to buy this in Los Angeles County, could I carry it out and be legal? And he looked at me and he said, well, is it in a backpack? Is it in, you know, and he started asking these questions. I'm like, whoa, this is very different from the Colorado I grew up in. This is crazy. And I, I said, I said, can you tell me what would be the safest way for me to just buy one of these things and then not, you know, run into problems in the parking lot, just walking to my car. And he said, well, you could tie a string to it. I, I kid you not. This is what he said. He said, at the point of sale, you could tie a string to it. And then um, as you're walking, just drag it along on the ground. He, he was totally serious. He was totally serious. And I, and I said, that would be my legal way. And he said, yeah, because you're not, it's not, it, you could just drop the string if you have a problem. I was like, are you kidding me? So, so I, I so knives started getting on my radar. This is a few years ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is just pandemonium for law enforcement discretion to, based on discrimination. Because I mean, I, I see racial discrimination. If there's that much discretion in the officer, because he said, we just don't enforce them usually unless you're a bad character, but it's up to the discretion of the, of yeah, the responding officer. That was probably the better way to describe it. It's up to their discretion. Uh, and, and again, the other problem we have is that most law enforcement people in California don't really know what the law is anyway. Yeah, and, that's and true. A, so that, that, that's a, that becomes a problem as well. So part of the freedom work you're doing is alerting people to how crazy laws are. And of course, the more there are, the harder it is to, to be free. Well, that's definitely, that that's definitely true. Our, our problem is, when, you know, none of us want violent people running around you know with, with 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 arms none of us want you know people that are you know have mental issues uh you know running around you know with arms uh but the problem is you got to craft the laws in a narrow tailored way that don't take the rights away from everybody and unfortunately the gun control gun prohibition movement in this country really wants to take it away from everybody and so they always write the laws in a way that disarm people from who should be able to have firearms from having them and that's where we draw the line right 
Yeah. So it really shouldn't have anything to do with the features of the knife. Like, for example, the sheriff was saying it depends on how long it is. Is it is it a folding knife? Does it have does it does it snap back? Does it uh, you know, I was like, what What does this have to do with <laughs> why are these features have well, anything yeah, to do with to, to give you some examples in, in New York City? Their knife laws are so crazy that a lot of people in the construction fields that, you know, or, or, or need a knife and, then, you know, they're on ladders uh, and you only you really you have to hold the ladder with one hand so you don't fall, you know, fall off, especially at high elevations. And you need the knife, you know, and if you have a knife that can be opened by one hand, uh, right. it's illegal. It's illegal in New York City. So what happens is that oh. in the construction trades, they're basically breaking the law every day because you have to climb the ladder and ha have a knife that you can open with one hand, slip up with one hand. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's illegal in New York City. So there's, it's, the knife laws in some ways are as crazy or crazier than the gun laws. I think they are. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, but I see a lot of people carrying knives, uh, like people that you wouldn't think are Second Amendment people. And I think it's very popular now because you have the 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 new technology and they're very attractive. And I, I see lots of people carrying them. I mean, it used to be that it was rare to more rare to see people with buck knives. You know the the leather thing on the on the belt. Uh, I don't see that anymore. I see like the ones that are in the pocket and the ones that you can open with one hand. Uh, those yeah, are very well popular. So. Well, knives are a handy tool to have. Uh, right, for all sorts of reasons. Them. Unfortunately, a lot of knife owners don't realize it's, it's also a Second Amendment issue, uh, and so they don't get engaged or fight some of these anti-knife laws. Uh, but that's starting to change a whole lot because a lot there are a lot more anti-knife laws that are being passed. You seem like you're really uh, calm and collected and logical. So if if someone were to ask you about this magazine case that you just mentioned uh, about a half hour ago, and I know you got to go in a few minutes, but if you could if you could just share with us um, what what is it about the magazine issue? Like why why is that not common sense to limit magazines to ten rounds? What do you have against this, Alan? What what well, you know? Let me give you a good example. You're a storekeeper in one of the Mer America's major cities that now have all these riots and looters coming in, ripping off everything in your store, and a lot of them are armed. So they break into your store. You got you know 30, 40 people you know take stealing your property as an example, threatening your life maybe. Uh, multiple of, of them are you know can be armed, and you only have ten bullets, and you need more than ten bullets when you have three or four people firing guns at you. Uh, or coming at you with, with, with you know with sharp objects, uh, you know it's just a, it's a, it, it's a limit on your on your means of self defense. And nowhere in the Bill of Rights or at the time the Bill of Rights was put together with any laws that in the United States that limited you know you, you to only a few rounds in your firearm. Uh, it just it, it, there's no historical nothing in the text of the Second Amendment, and no historical or traditions at the time. It, the founding fathers put it in place existed saying that you should be limited on your ammunition uh you know it's and and, and 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 these magazines are commonly owned millions and millions tens of millions of these magazines are out there and most firearms today are made to function with a magazine larger than just 10 rounds significant number of semi-automatic handguns are you know come with a standard yeah. capacity magazine of over 10 rounds yeah it just doesn't make any sense yeah it's arbitrary yeah, is what I hear totally you saying. Totally arbitrary, capricious. Yeah. What part of New York City did you grow up in? Queens. Okay. What was that like? Did you did you ever have anti gun sediments growing up? Just curiously, from your neighbors or no, anything? not pro gun, not anti gun. <laughs> I mean, growing up, I wasn't really you know nobody talked about it. Uh, it wasn't until college that I started really getting engaged in reading philosophical books on individual rights and, and, and history and, and the you know, Bill of Rights, the Constitution, uh, how it came to be, uh, what, what values at the time were, uh, that I started realizing the biggest threats. And the biggest threat when I was in college to any place in the Bill of Rights was the threats to the Second Amendment, which is the same case today. Things haven't changed. You mentioned that these are God-given rights. And so... Uh, do you have a religious background that, that helps you discern? Um, 
No, I wouldn't say it, it, it's because of a religious background why I would take that position, but there are certain rights that, that you know governments don't give you, uh, and your Second Amendment rights are one of those. The government didn't give you that right. It preexisted the government existence. Yeah. I read uh, parts of Antonin Scalia's uh, autobiography, I think it was, uh, where he mentions he grew up in New York City, and he was on the Rifle Club. I don't know if you know this. Yes. Uh, and he, yes. he would travel on the subway with his rifle as a teenager <laughs> in fact when i was with him in nuremberg germany when that the hell decision came down from the appeals court we talked about that is that right wow yeah. wow he was a he was one of a kind um i'm glad that we have the supreme court we do um of course it's a now it's about national politics because as you've mentioned the work is not legislative it's it's judicial right now but that depends on having the right judges in place. Yes, it does. Is a, which is a series of prior political uh, engagement that people need to be involved with. They need to know that the folks on the court now are there because of political um, a movement politically. And you got to be aware of that. You got to be aware of the political dynamics because the future generation might not have those same judges. And so what do you, so do you have anything to say about that as far as activism? Well, well right now, the last, the Bruin decision of the Supreme Court, uh, the gun rights side got six votes, the anti-gun rights side got three votes. So right now we have a court that leans in the direction of Second Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. But the three anti-gun judges on that court are extremely anti-gun rights. Uh, and of course, you know, we have a presidential election coming up in 2024, uh, and a lot's going to depend on who gets appoint new judges to that court. And for gun owners and gun rights, this upcoming election is extremely important. All right. I got a couple more questions for you really quick. Um, are you a Glock guy, 1911 guy, you personally, <laughs> or revolver? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I prefer a semi-automatic, like a 1911 over a revolver by a lot. Uh, I own Glocks. I own SIGs. I own Smith and Wesson. Uh, I, I'm sort of uh, the Turks in between. Uh, I, I like them all. I mean, they're all very good firearms. I, I probably fire best with a Glock, uh, mm -hmm. but I also like some of the safety features on some of the other guns that, that don't appear on a Glock. So I'm sort of all over the map with it. Uh, I think when somebody picks a firearm, they need to pick what they feel comfortable with. Uh, and what Absolutely. they feel you know, secure with. So I'm not, I don't advocate one brand over another per se, uh, but I have a gun collection that's rather large. You're a collector. I'm yeah. a collector. And are do you carry? Do you Are you legal I'm to carry? I'm licensed to carry in the majority of states in the United States. Uh, and yes, I do. Okay. So that's important to you to be trained. Uh, how often do you get to the range? Unfortunately, because I'm spending so much time defending gun rights these days, I don't get to the range as much as I would like. Uh, That's and, sad, uh, but it, I can understand. You yeah. know, and so, so it's, I don't get much free time, uh, yeah. but I have a really great uh, range experience coming up uh, next month, and I'm kind of excited about it. What, what, what's your schedule like? What, what's the life of a founder of SA, Second Amendment Foundation like? What, what do you do? It's a, it's 24 seven. Uh, you know, I do a lot of traveling and speaking on weekends, uh, and working during the week very heavily, you know, with lawyers on these 54 cases we currently have going on out there. I do a lot of media appearances, like being on, on your show. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. th there's a, a lot of fundraising I have to do to raise the money to be able to file these lawsuits yeah. on our public education campaigns. Uh, it, it's all encompassing. And so how do how do you get the money to file the suits and how can people support Second Amendment Foundation? Well, we have memberships and we have donations and people can go to just saf.org, saf.org and join or donate online. Uh, it's probably the easiest way. Uh, also, while they're online, they can check out all the legal cases we've got filed, the news releases to see what we're doing and see how the money gets spent. We're very transparent. Our audits and tax returns are on our website, so one can see exactly what we do with the money. Uh, and again, oh, I'd like cool. to welcome any of your viewers or listeners to, to, to join and donate and become part of us at saf.org. Okay, check out saf.org. 
And I can personally attest to you that when you become a life member, you get a very nice package in the mail with, with a little bit of swag and you get a nice little thing for your wall and it's very well done. And we, and like, a, like Alan has said, so many, so much great history here with Sam Sloan in Hawaii, with the Heller decision, with the McDonald decision. He, he just met, he's talked about, he's met Otis McDonald, the famous guy. And so we really thank you for all that you do and all that SAF does, uh, Mr. Alan Gottlieb. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely.